It's always nice to hear from the uh, on the national office. I used to work with the national office. If you uh, if you know my history, I spent five and a quarter year, five and a half years actually, with uh, working for the what I called the NMC, the National Ministry Center, and the president of the alliance. Well, we had a blessed time together last Sunday, did we not? Wow, really? <laughs> I don't. I thought it was fantastic. I thought we had a great time. We had a baptism. We had someone else step into membership here. We had a wonderful time of worship. We had a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we looked at three clear signs by which we might know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Christ is risen from the dead. Glory to God. You know, we had 132 people here on Sunday. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for those who came forward to mark Easter Sunday as a day they recommitted themselves to Jesus Christ. And then yesterday, 19 folks came out to go on a prayer walk to cover our community in a canopy of prayer, which is key. If we want to reach the community, we have to pray for the community. These are significant advances in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. God is at work. God is at work. And we are grateful. Amen? Amen. Well, speaking of work, I'm going to start with a public service announcement. And that's that if you looked at the calendar recently, you know that April 30th uh, falls on a Sunday, which means you have exactly two weeks today to file your taxes. Just in case you didn't know, you've got two weeks today to file your taxes. And because that day is a Sunday, the Canada Revenue Agency... Uh, official website says that your, your concern is going to be considered on time if it is postmarked on or before the next business day. So technically, you have two weeks starting tomorrow to get your taxes done. I don't mind doing my taxes. Of course, when I say I do my taxes, what I mean is that I gather the receipts and paperwork so someone else can do my taxes. It's, I find it helpful to have someone else do that because that gives me a second set of eyes to look everything over, make sure all the paperwork is in order, make sure all the, uh, that nothing is getting missed and everything is being done by the book, as it were. And doing your taxes has a silver lining. It means you get to review where you spent all your money because you gather all those receipts together and you tally out the totals and when they're all out there and you're written down, you know you know beyond a shadow of a doubt exactly how much you had and where it all went. There's no longer any misunderstandings or self-delusion about these things. You can't say, and you may say, wow, I didn't realize I learned that I earned that little. Or you may say, wow, I didn't realize I spent that much. Or perhaps you will say, wow, I didn't realize I gave that much away in donations. But looking at the totals, you know because when you look at the totals, you can see how you spend your treasure. And how you spend your treasure is a sure and certain sign of your priorities. It's a clear sign, a bold neon sign, if you will, of what your priorities really are. Not what you say they are, but what they really are. And sometimes there's a pretty big gap between what we say and what we're actually doing. And this is one way to close that gap. For instance, and I can show you that. For instance, if you look at the screen, you'll see that our federal government spends most of its money on discretionary spending. The various programs and departments that it wants to spend money on. And spends almost as much on social protection, on old age security, family benefits, disability payments, unemployment, and the like. And then helping our provinces, our provinces provide health care, interest on the debt, equalization, and indigenous services. So while our government says it's all about helping people, that's really, that's their primary message, we can know that it spends about the same amount on advancing its own political agenda. And NATO can look at that and see that defense in Canada is actually a pretty low priority, no matter what the Prime Minister tells Brussels. In comparison, one can see that the USA spends most of its money on defense, a significant chunk on interest payments and actual spending to better the citizens' daily lives is much less of a priority than it is here in Canada. Just looking at how we and our neighbors spend uh, money gives us an instant 
visual understanding, an instant impression of how our cultures differ. How nations spend their treasure is a sign of what their priorities are and how we as households spend our money is a sign of our priorities, of how we want to manage things. And if how we manage our money demonstrates that, then friends, how we spend our time, much more so. Much more so. Because money can be printed by governments and money can be made by you and I through all sorts of different kinds of work, things that we do. But time cannot. Time cannot. And therefore, time is of much more value and it therefore all the clearer a window into our priorities. Today we're going to start a brand new series. We just finished the book of James, gaining what it means to have authentic faith. And we've recommitted ourselves to Christ through the preaching of the deity and of the death and of the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ through Easter. And what remains then is how to live out our faith in Him. And that's what this next series is going to be all about. Making God's priority our priority. Making God's priority our our priority. Because we belong to Him. We are His people, sacrificed by His blood. His blood shed for us on the cross. And He is our Lord. He's our sanctifier. He's our healer. He's our, he's our Savior. And He's our coming King. And therefore, because He is our Lord, we want to honor Him by making His priority our priority. That's how we know He's our Lord. So that when we see His face, we will know His joy. And I want to say that again, because if you're taking notes today, you want to write this down. We honor Christ as our Lord by making His priority our priority, so that when we see His face, we will know His joy. After all, that's what it means to be His disciple. A disciple is one who seeks to be like their master, not just in character, but also in action. We want to have the same priority that Jesus had. A priority that all who read the Scripture can know because all the Scripture speaks of the priority of Christ, the reason He came, the reason He died, the reason He was buried, and the reason He rose again. And that is to save lost sinners. To rescue the perishing. The challenge we have, then, is translating His divine purpose into human context. Because that's how God did it. How do we do it? We don't have all of His, limit, His limitlessness. We don't have all of His resources. We don't have all of His power. How do we go about that same purpose? And to that point, countless books have been written. Countless seminars have been assembled. Countless PowerPoints and teaching tools have been adapted. And I have no doubt that here, from this pulpit at Kingston Alliance, many sermons have been directed to this very point but that we in our day might participate in God's purpose of reaching people with the good news of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, we are going to take a series of Sundays to look very closely at Jesus' method of reaching the lost, to how He tells us to do it. That we might do what He wants us to do. Turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. In this series, we will be looking at the first nine verses of chapter 10 of the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 10. There's a pew Bible ahead of you. You can navigate there in your device, as the case may be. And as you turn there, let us commit this again to the Lord in prayer. Father, now we open your word. We've been talking to you in prayer. We've been worshiping you in song. We've been speaking of you and thinking of you and setting aside all the things that are happening in the week that you might be our focus today. And now that you are our focus and now that we have, you have our attention, Father, speak to us through your word. For your word ever speaks clearer than anything. Father, there it is, black and white, what you would want to communicate to us. Father, let us hear that. And let us hear from your word, the Holy Spirit speaking in alignment with your word to our very hearts. Lord, that we would leave here different people than who came in. More like you. Walking closer to you. Being more obedient to you. Honoring you more as Lord of our lives than we ever have before. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 9. And we're going to focus today on the first two verses only, because in the first two verses, we find three key principles as we set ourselves about doing what God would have us to do, doing the work that God would have us to do, having His priority, what He came to do, what He came to demonstrate, and what He came to accomplish. So if you open your Bibles, you'll see there, Luke 10, verse 1, it begins, after this, it says, and stop right there. After this refers to what just happened. It's like when you read therefore, you have to kind of go back and say, why is it there for? And if you glance up into chapter 9, starting in verse 57, you can see what just happened. And so though we're going to focus on Luke 10, verses 1 to 2, in today's message, let's go back and start reading in verse 9, verse 57, chapter 9, verse 57, that we might capture the context in which Christ is speaking to us. Luke 9, starting at 57. As they were walking along the road, that's Jesus and his disciples, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back, is fit for service in the kingdom of God. And Jesus said all this before we get to our study passage. There's three separate but related conversations that happen. And they're put there for a reason. And if we look back, if we we stand back from the Scripture and we get a bird's eye view, we can see how this context sets up our study passage. Because when you pull back and you see the big picture, you realize that Jesus has been calling people to Himself. He's been gathering disciples to Himself. And He's been calling them to have the same priority as He did. To engage in what He was doing. But some were making excuses. They had reasons. Good reasons for having different priorities. The first fellow there reasons that his own comfort is a good reason. He was expecting that if he follows Jesus into the work, he would find himself resting easy. Didn't Jesus say, my yoke is is light and my burden is easy? But Jesus warned him, it is not always going to be comfortable. The second fellow reasoned that circumstance is a good reason to delay going into God's work. But Jesus said that God's purposes have to have priority. If they don't have, well, then you simply have another priority, don't you? You don't have his priority. And the last fellow here reasons that family commitments are a good reason to delay or at least interrupt the work. But Jesus solemnly observes, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. You cannot call Jesus Christ Lord and then refuse to follow him for some other reason. To say he's your Lord and not be engaged in his work is to disqualify yourself from the kingdom. Because His kingdom is where He is. God's kingdom is where the King is. And if you're not going to follow His leading, you effectively say, I don't want to be where you're going. And the context of our study passage then is this, the three reasons why folks do not want to engage in God's work. Because it's comfortable. Because it's inconvenient, or uncomfortable, because it's inconvenient, because it means putting God first before all else that we hold dear. But consider Christ's response to each one. Read verse 62 out loud with me, it's on the screen. Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. My friend, I pray that you have not believed in vain, as we saw last week, 
when Paul preached in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, he said, you have believed in vain. The gospel is not some magic dogma. It isn't a formula for gaining access to heaven. It's not a password into the divine presence. It's a way of life for God's people. That we might know Jesus Christ as Lord. That we might follow Him as our Lord. That we might follow Him, making His priority our priority. And that means engaging in His work. To call Him Lord and then not fully follow Him is just highly disrespectful. It's like when you have teenagers and you say to your kid, hey, you got to be back by 10 o'clock at night. You set a curfew for them. And then they go out. They come And they say they're going to do that. They say they're going to come back at 10 o'clock, but 10 o'clock comes and they don't show up. In the middle of the night, you wake up and you hear the door close and you look at the alarm clock and it says 3 a.m. Well, they might as well have lied to your face. Far be it from us to do that to our Lord. Far be it from us. We should honor Christ as our Lord. Amen? So let's go back to our study passage then. It says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of Him to every town and place He was about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into His harvest field. Amen. Now, Luke is the only gospel account to pick this up. John is focused entirely on the gospel, on the divinity of Christ, and on the event and the account of Passion Week, what Christ did to save us. Mark is a condensed account of Christ's life. It leaves all sorts of things out. It's the shortest of the gospel accounts. And Matthew is primarily speaking to Jews. So he's careful to mention that Jesus had earlier instructed the apostles to do a similar work among the Jews. But he leaves out the Gentiles. And Luke recorded that earlier sending out of the apostles in Luke chapter 9. But Matthew condenses the sending out of the twelve apostles with the sending out of the disciples. Matthew 9.37 says, Then he said to his disciples, meaning the twelve apostles and the disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And you know what? Matthew is not wrong in condensing these two accounts because apostle or disciple, the work starts with the same command. The work starts with the same command. And do you know what that is? It is because while not all disciples are apostles, All apostles are disciples, and all are appointed to the work. Let me say that again. Not all disciples are apostles, but all apostles are disciples, and all are appointed to the work. You and I might not be an apostle the way Matthew and John were apostles, but you and I are disciples the way Luke and Mark were disciples. An apostle and disciple, both are appointed to the work. Both. Both are appointed to the work. The office of your spiritual gift does not lead to your assignment. Your assignment leads to your spiritual gift. You get that? Don't get those two things backwards. All who call on Christ Jesus as Lord are appointed to the work of Jesus Christ. That's why God doesn't instantly transport us to His domain. Otherwise, someone would say, hey, pray with me to receive Christ. And they would pray with you and then poof, they'd be gone. Automatically brought to the presence of the Father. Why would you stay here? Unless God has a reason for you to stay here. And that reason is His work. If that wasn't part of being a disciple, folks would be saved and they would be gone unless they were apostles. You may well say that you're not an apostle, but you are a disciple. Yes? Yes? Yes! If you call on Christ Jesus, you are a disciple of Christ Jesus, and you're appointed to the work. That doesn't mean that you try to educate yourself into becoming an apostle. You cannot do that. 
The office we have is appointed to us, and the work we're appoint- we have is appointed to us. The first may differ, the latter does not. Friends, it is not God's plan that everyone become a pastor or everyone become a full-time career missionary. Because Jesus picked a limited number of apostles, but he accepts an unlimited number of disciples. An unlimited number of disciples. One commentator I read this past week had a very keen observation. He noted that when Jesus sent out the 12 apostles in Luke 9 and Matthew 9, Jesus sent them out, the apostles, to retrace his steps. He sent them to the people of Israel to gather in the harvest that he himself had already sown. In fact, he warns them not to go to the Gentiles at all. But in Luke 10, Jesus sends out the disciples to prepare for his arrival. And that's a key difference. That's a key difference. Reverend Michael Wilcock noted, he said, many may feel that while following is within their capabilities, within their wheelhouse as disciples, they can do that. Heralding is only for those who are especially gifted, like the apostles. But Michael says that this text here in Luke contains more than one hint that every Christian is expected to do both. In the first place, there is probably symbolic meaning in the number of disciples sent out, because already Jesus had commissioned the 12 of his many disciples to be leaders of the new people of God. And if this number is meant to correspond to the 12 sons of Jacob, the other would be significant in a similar way. And 70 was the number of God of Jacob's family when they went down to Egypt. It was the number of the representative elders when they journeyed out of Egypt. And I would also say it's also the number of the table of nations in Genesis 10. But Reverend Wilcox says, we might distinguish between the two symbolic numbers by saying 12 is the patriarchs of Israel, that's the apostles, the 70, the people of Israel, is the church in general. And the marching orders for the 70 are by their very nature then applicable for every Christian. Listen, exceptional people are not required. It is the message they carry and the driving power that carries them that is exceptional. Praise the Lord. Friends, if you know Jesus Christ, you have a divine mandate. A divine mandate. Exceptional people are not required. It's the message you carry. It's the power of Jesus Christ as you carry it that is exceptional. By the way, Bible scholars tell us that the 70, or 72 as it may be, because the original text reads the 70 two by twos in the Koine Greek. And you could take that to mean Uh, perhaps 35 teams of two, totaling 70, or it could mean 36 teams of two, which is 72 by twos. So it's just like reading in the English, 70, two by two. Does it mean 72 by two, or does it mean 70, two by two? And so that's why some translations like the NSAB say 70, and some like the NIV say 72. You say, oh, that's a discrepancy. It's not a discrepancy. It just... Which way are you going to take that phrase? But Bible scholars say that these teams were sent to the eastern side of the Jordan, to the many towns that Jesus would shortly visit on his final trek to Jerusalem. And that's a key difference between this account, sending out the disciples, versus the early account, sending out the apostles. In fact, no later, no less than the late great R.C. Sproul said, Luke doesn't tell us exactly where these 72 were sent, But the conjecture is that they journeyed on the east side of the Jordan to make sure that all the cities there were covered with the preaching and the proclamation of the coming kingdom of God. And there were some hints that the cities to which they were sent were not centers of devotion, but cities which had been infiltrated by pagan ideas. And that's because on the east side of the Jordan, just past that, was all of the pagan nations. The towns these disciples were sent to are a whole lot like Kingston full of secular folks, full of Gentiles, full of people who do not yet know God Most High, people outside the kingdom of God. And yet, though they are sent to secular towns, one might know that the Lord meant for them to have an abundant harvest. Look at verse 2. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. 
The harvest is plentiful, Jesus said. I want you to, to, to think about that. When Jesus looks out over Kingston, when he sees Amherstview and Bath and Eastview and Grananaque, or when he looks out over Odessa and Sydenham and over Inbury and Charbot Lake and all of Frontenac County, he says, the harvest is plentiful. The harvest is plentiful. It's not meager. He doesn't say, oh, it's barely worthwhile. You should probably not go there. No, he says it's plentiful. It's ready ready to be harvested. It's not barely out of the ground yet. You know, right now, if you drive by a farmer's field, you might see some, some winter wheat coming up, but it's barely out of the ground. Jesus says, no, this harvest is ready. This harvest is plentiful. Friend, we have to stop with the scarcity mindset when it comes to sharing Jesus Christ. People will tell you that no one wants to hear the gospel nowadays, and that's not true. People are actually hungry for the good news. In fact, just last week, the National Post, the National Post, a totally secular newspaper, reported saying a curious demographic trend in Canada is that spiritual or religious belief has persisted despite the famously steep decline in church attendance and formal religious observance. That's a secular newspaper telling us that people might not be coming to church, but they're hungry for God, and they're hungry to grow in their knowledge of God all the same. And that just lines up with Scripture. Because Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful. And he ought to know he's God after all. The second member of the Trinity, which means the truth of the matter is that the harvest is plentiful. Therefore, if we are not reaping a plentiful harvest, the fault is not with the harvest. The fault is not with the harvest. The, ho- the fault is with either, must be with the harvesters. If you're a farmer and you know the harvest is ready and you know you can see the field, you can say, look at this vast field and look at all this grain that's ready to come. And yet your workers come in and say, oh, there's hardly anything there. And they, they have not even a third of a sack of grain after two days of work. You say to yourself, well, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Either they're not going about the work, or they're going about it erroneously. But glory to God, such things can be resolved by following Jesus' direction. Such things can be resolved by following Jesus' direction. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this series. We're going to follow Jesus' direction. We're going to understand how to engage in the work the way Jesus wants to engage in the work, the way he tells us to engage in the work. And that direction starts here in verse 2. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Our part in the work of Jesus Christ, hear me now, our part in the work of Jesus Christ starts in prayer. It starts in prayer. The Greek word Jesus uses there is theome. It means ask, request, plead, entreat, petition. Ask, request, plead, and entreat the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. And yet, even as we think about that, something within us rises up to object. We say, hold on here, Marcus. What are you saying? Are you saying that Jesus wants us to plead with Jesus to do what Jesus wants to do? How does that make any sense? Why doesn't Jesus just do whatever pleases Jesus? Why would he even mention it to us? And why would he ask us to plead with him to do what he wants to do? It's a legitimate question. One could say, well, why didn't Jesus say, hey, go into the harvest field? Why didn't he just do that? Well, friends, aside from the fact that he does that, if you read into the next verse, you'll see that he does, and we'll cover that next week. But I want to see that he asks us to stop and pray first. And I, and I want to shine some light here on why he commands us to do that, to pray that he would send people first. Why would he do that? Why would he ask us to pray first? Well, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, way back at the beginning of the Bible, way back at the fall of mankind. Recall that Adam and Eve had done precisely what God told them not to do in eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 3, verses 8 and 9 say, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden. In the cool of the day, 
and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? So God comes along near to where Adam is. All-knowing, all-wise, God most high comes along near where Adam is and he calls out to Adam, where are you? And on the surface of it, well, I don't want to call it a silly question because it's God's question. And I don't want to question God's question. But surely God most high knows where Adam is. Surely he knows that. It's like when you play hide-and-seek with your kids and you see feet sticking out from behind the drapes and yet you say all the same, oh, where are you? I don't know if I can find you. And yet you can see their feet right there. You know exactly where they are. I mean, the Lord here is not playing a game. This is very serious. But the principle is the same. The question is not for God's sake. God asked that question for Adam's sake. Not for his sake. It's so Adam and Eve will use their newfound knowledge of good and evil. So they'll apply the skill they just illegally acquired and realize that now they're apart from God. That now they are no longer fully with Him because their spirit is already dead on account of their sin. And God asked them the question so that they themselves will discover their lostness. And so that they themselves might start to follow the sound of his voice and find their way back to him. And that same principle is at work in our study passage in Luke 10. The Lord asks us to ask, he tells us to ask him not for his sake, but for ours. He asks us, he tells us to ask him not for his sake, but for our sake. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. He doesn't, ask, uh, he doesn't command us to ask him for his sake. He's not like, oh, I can't send people unless you ask me. No, he asks us, he commands us to ask him for our sake because, and I believe the Lord would really have us get this, because prayer is the primary way to reach the lost, the premier way to reach the lost, and the precondition to reaching the lost. You can't reach the lost apart from prayer. It's the primary way, and that all can do it. All can do it. It's like prayer walking. When we did this yesterday, we, the first thing I said is that anybody can prayer walk. A four-year-old can walk and talk to God at the same time. And all can pray. Kids can pray. The physical and mentally challenged can pray. Even those suffering immobility can pray. All can pray. The young can pray. The old can pray. The healthy can pray. The sick can pray. We can all pray. We can all entreat the Lord. We can all call on Him in prayer and ask Him to send workers into His harvest field. And in praying for others to go, we partner with those others to reach the lost. When I pray for the lost of Kingston, I am joining my voice to everyone who prays for the lost of Kingston. I'm asking the Lord for the same thing they're asking for. And when God answers my prayer, He answers their prayer at the same time. I'm not just praying with myself, but I'm praying with others in the Kingston Ministerial, others in the men's Thursday morning prayer group, others whose names I do not yet know who pray for the lost of Kingston, with everyone who's running and praying for an Alpha in our city, with others who, who go to myriads of churches here in Kingston and lift up the lost of our city, the tens of thousands of folks who are here in Kingston and yet do not know Christ as their Savior. So prayer is the primary way because all can do it and because in doing so we partner with others. It's also the premier way. It's the best way to reach others. It's the best way because Jesus himself said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and then I will raise them up on the last day. Salvation from our perspective is a personal decision, a private decision. It's just our decision. And from, but from God's perspective, from his vantage point, beyond our space and beyond our time, it is not just that. Reality is that he also draws them. 
In fact, they only come to hear the gospel because he loves them enough to send them others to preach the gospel. Because he loves them enough to arrange their circumstance so they can hear the good news of the kingdom. Because he loves them so much that he wants them to hear the gospel again and again and again and again. And in his sovereignty, he proposes to answer that prayer. He purposes to answer that prayer so that those who pray might gain fruitfulness by their prayers and no reward in eternity for having prayed. Therefore, prayer is the premier way. And I want us to hear this. Prayer for the lost is the most spiritually profitable thing we could possibly do. The most spiritually profitable thing we can do. I tell you the truth, there's some people like our shut-ins, like Lynn Rizzo, living in extended care, who do more work for the kingdom of God than those who labor 40 hours a week with, their, with use of their arms and legs and, and eyes in church ministry. No one comes to the Father unless he draws them. And in praying for others, Lynn partners with God in changing spiritual reality. Friends, that is an awesome work because the spiritual always is greater than the physical. And so prayer, prayer is the premier work. It's the best kind, the greatest kind of spiritual labor. And glory to God, prayer is the precondition. It's the precondition of Jesus here as our Lord and our King has sovereignly decreed that prayer must come first. And he's not just making a point here. He's being very literal. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. That's a command. It's not an observation. It's like, hey, you know what? I've noticed this. Maybe you should think about it. No, he says, he commands it. As the message version puts it, what a huge harvest, Jesus says. How few the harvest hands. So on your knees, ask the God of the harvest to send harvest hands. You know, I have to say that over 38 years of serving Christ as my Lord, I've observed that when I pray for something, when I plead with God for something, really seek His face about it, I wind up opening my ears for His response. And you know what I sometimes hear? I open my ears to hear a still, small voice in the matter. And I think you know what He says sometimes. It's right there in verse 3. Look at that first word, verse 3. The first phrase if you're using the message version. I'm not going to speak it right now. I'll put it on the screen because we haven't prayed for it just yet. But next Sunday morning, after you and I have spent a whole week praying for it, asking God to send out workers, maybe then we'll be ready to hear this next word. But we're not ready to hear it until we've prayed for it. We're not ready to hear it until we've prayed for it. Will you do that this week? Will you take some time out of your schedule? Will you open your phone, look at your calendar, and book some time to pray for workers here in Kingston and outside to the far places of the world? You can do that, you know. You can set an alarm on your phone for 10.02, and every 10.02, whether that be in the morning or the evening, you can remember, oh yes, Lord, send out workers into your harvest field. Or you can come and join us in the men's prayer group on Thursday morning, or the mixed prayer group on Wednesday afternoon, or the women's prayer group on Thursday afternoon, and pray for more workers. And later this month, on the first Saturday of April here, we are going to host a vision camp with Eastgate Alliance and InterCP, a one-day training seminar for those who are going to go to the far-off places. Friends, that's right on your church bulletin. Circle it. Plan to be here. It's a great opportunity, not just to listen into the seminar, but to sit in the back and pray for everyone else there, for the workers who are being sent out into the harvest field. So come that morning or come that afternoon, come that whole day and pray for workers. We can do that much, can we not? 
We can pray for them. So there's three opportunities to act. Three opportunities to put this message into action. And I'm going to ask the worship team to come up now as we close in prayer. Father, you've given us, again, a very practical message. A very practical message. And Father, you are setting us up. Just as we began this, week, this, this year off, the beginning of January, and you gave us this word that this year, 2023, should be the most spiritually profitable year we've ever had. That we should see more answers to prayer and live more of the Christ life than we ever have in our whole lives. That's why you've made this year. That's why you give us this day. Father, we want to participate in that. And to participate in that, Father, we need to have authentic faith. And then we need to take that authentic faith and put it into action. And here it is, Lord. The first action you have for us is to pray. To seek your face in mind of all the lost around us. Father, we pray for workers. We pray for those who would go out. We pray that you would answer that prayer, Lord. Some of those answers are not going to be what we want to hear necessarily just now. But Father, as we continue to pray, when that answer comes, we will be very happy to hear it. Very happy to receive what you have for us. Because there is a great harvest yet to come, Lord. There's still people groups who do not speak. There's still languages spoken on earth that are not spoken in heaven. There's still people, tens of thousands of people, neighbors and co-workers and friends, family members, even spouses who do not yet know you. Oh, Lord, send out workers. Send people to preach the gospel to Kingston. Send people to preach the gospel to our families. Send people to preach the gospel to our neighbors. Send people to preach the gospel to those who are perishing right in front of our eyes. Have mercy on them, O Lord God. Have mercy on them. Pour out your Spirit on us, O Lord, and send out workers into your harvest field. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.